Hello and welcome to the WYHS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9. I'm Paul Kretschmer. On today's broadcast, you'll hear part of the report from the Connecticut Voices for Children agenda for 2024 legislative session. Emily Byrne, the executive director of Connecticut Voices for Children, was the presenter on this broadcast. Our new publication, the 2023 State of Early Childhood. Uh, But before we dive in, I wanted to provide some framing for the report findings. Um, First, a bit about us and why we focus on the issues we do. Um, Connecticut Voices for Children is a research and advocacy organization. We work across the state and nationally because we envision a Connecticut where all our children thrive. As many of us know, children are part of families uh, and families are part of communities and communities are part of the state. And so I say all this to say that the changes to the policies and funding we seek can't just be about children. They have to also be about families, communities, and our state overall. So if we think of this as a journey with children at the end, preceding that families, then communities, then the state, and then the country, we're really at the beginning of our collective journey. Once we understand the path, then we can determine the issues. What are the most, uh, what are the things most important to us to solve today, without which the next part of the journey can't be traveled or at least not traveled well? And so we know as researchers and advocates, the path to thriving children starts with eradicating poverty and advancing family economic security. The second framing note here is about the history of this report, as well as the current state of the early care and education system. As an organization, we've prioritized early childhood education since our founding in 1995 and have published this report since 2003. While we've recently brought in our attention to fair employment writ large with a focus on the early care sector, we maintain our work here because we know the import and impact of ECE for children, particularly children of color, and the economy, particularly the participation of women and women of color in the workforce. Unfortunately, today, there's a national childcare crisis in the United States. Parents can't afford quality care and often lack proximal access to it. Educator wages are undignified and providers can't hire fast enough. And the federal dollars and state contributions are woefully insufficient. The understanding that the early care market is broken is so widespread that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is saying as such. Now in truth, the current challenges the early care and education sector Mm -hmm. face existed before the pandemic. However, what's changed is that we're seeing a greater willingness to do something about it. In Connecticut, Governor Ned Lamont and Commissioner Beth Bayh have renewed our state's efforts to fix our early care and education system. They understand, like we do, that early care is essential infrastructure. And the Blue Ribbon Panel's report, released late last year, speaks to the transformational change needed. In closing, there are so many critical issues that should be addressed in the upcoming legislative session. However, we would argue that early care and education, because it's so deeply intersectional, is paramount to advancing family economic security. In fact, you'll hear from the research and recommendations from our report just how much early care and education intersects with fair employment, affordable housing, and tax reform policies, all of which help narrow the state Uh, the state's wide income and wealth disparity. Our ultimate aim with this report and all of our early care and education work is for systems change. Changes that ensure every parent that needs early care and education doesn't have to break the bank to pay for it. Every educator that chooses the sector as a profession is compensated fairly with dignified wages. And every child receiving early care and education is provided a high quality opportunity so that she may endeavor to succeed later in life. And with that said, I'm very pleased to turn the program over to Dr. Abdo Katsipas, who is the first author of our 2023 State of Early Childhood, and will lead the presentation of our report findings. Following the presentation, which is about 15 minutes, uh, Dr. Lauren Ruth, who is the second author, will lead Q&A. So with that said, Carla. Thank you, Emily. And as she already said, our presentation will provide an overview on our 2023-24 annual state of early childhood report 
response to the governor's blue ribbon panel on child care and a continuation of spotlighting disenfranchised populations. This presentation will happen in five parts. We will go over the background for early care and education, or abbreviated as ECE, which we'll frequently use moving forward, big picture trends, financial modeling for child care centers and family child care homes, ECE as it applies to children with special needs, and critical recommendations for an improved ECE system for children, families, providers, businesses, and the state overall. Connecticut's early care and education system comprises of both private and public care providers. Family child care homes, called FCCs, are care settings run out of the provider's home. Child care centers are more extensive facilities that may be public or private, and they may be not-for-profit or for-profit. Both can have children ranging from birth to school age. In this presentation, when we refer to child care centers, we refer to publicly funded centers. Many public schools have preschool classrooms, but do not offer care for infants and toddlers. All FCCs and CCCs and school-based programs are licensed through the Office of Early Childhood. State-level estimates suggest that each dollar the government provides to support ECE through a combination of subsidy programs and tax credits creates $3.80 in greater economic output, which includes ECE industry-level economic output, increased parental employment, and spending. This is to say that the government spending on Connecticut's ECE system is wise because these dollars produce substantially more value for the economy than the initial investment. According to a 2023 study on, conducted by Ready Nation, the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in an estimated national loss of $78 billion in parental income, $23 billion in business operational revenues, and $21 billion in taxes, a net national loss of $122 billion. This highlights the ECE industry's vital role in allowing parents to contribute to the economy. Outside of the economic benefits, high quality childcare closes achievement gaps in learning, particularly among children from low income families, immigrant families, children of color, children who are homeless, and children with special needs ages birth to five. Children who have experienced high quality infant, toddler, and preschool care tend to have better relationships with their peers and perform better in school. Today, Connecticut's ECE industry is shrinking. Providers make low wages, disproportionately impacting women, particularly those of color. Moreover, there is a high level of turnover as burnout occurs due to low wages, limited benefits, staff shortages, complex paperwork, and heavy demands on time and stress. According to Annie E. Casey Kids Count data, the average cost of care across 2017 to 2021 is $18,156 annually for a child care center and $11,955 annually for a family child care home. Connecticut is the third most expensive state in the country for child care, and 39% of three and four year olds are not in preschool in Connecticut, an increase of five percentage points since the last 2012 to 2016 data collection. To address these issues, Governor Lamont and the Office of Early Childhood Commissioner Bai established the Blue Ribbon Panel on Child Care which consists of parents, early childhood education experts, business leaders, providers in higher education, public school, child care settings, and legislators to create actionable plans for affordable child care that is accessible to families and financially viable for providers. We applaud the work of the Blue Ribbon Panel on Child Care and also seek to extend that work in this report. Our recommendations mirror those of the panel, and many come from prior reports that remain relevant today. Moving on to big picture trends. According to United Way 211 child care data, the overall number of providers is decreasing, a trend most visible among family child care home providers. The total number of licensed FCCs, as seen here in gray, dropped from 1,908 in 2022 to 1,817 in 2023, a reduction of 91 providers there has been a total reduction of 1,359 licensed FCCs from 2010 to 2023. In contrast, the number of exempt and licensed child care centers are relatively stable. Child care slots, another frequently used term, 
are defined as the number of openings available in a child care setting as determined by its licensing capacity. Child care slots may be filled or unfilled, and providers may choose only to fill some slots allowed by their license. Please note that we are discussing state-funded child care slots. The orange line indicates slots dedicated to preschoolers, while the blue line indicates slots devoted to infants and toddlers. There is a shortage of infant and toddler slots, which the Blue Ribbon Panel estimates to be 17,000. Fewer providers offer infant and toddler care than preschool care, and providers that do offer infant and toddler care must also care for preschoolers to boost revenue. The number of infant and toddler slots dropped from 21,109 in 2022 to 17,619 in 2023, a reduction of 3,490 seats in one year. The number of state-funded preschool slots is markedly higher than infants and toddlers, as are program options for publicly funded care. According to the Blue Ribbon Panel, there is a statewide surplus of 26,901 preschool slots, but these slots are not spread evenly across Connecticut leaving 42 out of 169 towns with unmet preschool needs. Yet the slots available to preschool, preschoolers sorry, are steadily decreasing. From 2020 to 2023, Connecticut experienced a reduction of 14,891 preschool slots, from 64,789 to 49,898, the lowest it has ever been. This map, which is created by the Bipartisan Policy Center, shows Connecticut's child care gap by state Senate district. The white spots indicate adequate child care, and dark blue spots indicate that many families sit on waiting lists for months and even years trying to access licensed care. Care for Kids is the state's voucher program to help low-income working families access care. Funded by the Federal Child Care and Development Block Grant, Care for Kids requires a certain amount of matched funding from the state in Connecticut. Families that earn less than 60% of the state median income can apply for Care for Kids. Depending on their income level, they may be asked to pay a family fee of up to 10%. As indicated in the graph, state policymakers sought to help stabilize families during the COVID-19 pandemic by extending Care for Kids eligibility guidelines and providing funding to allow more families to enroll. The increased enrollment numbers we see indicate the success of these policy changes. Here we see an increase in the number of infants and toddlers served, with the highest number of them served through the Care for Kids subsidy. From 2021 to 2022, we see an increase in the number of infants and toddlers served from 5,713 to 7,449. The biggest numbers of preschoolers are supported by school readiness programs in priority districts, indicated in gray, and federal and state Head Start programs, indicated in light blue. School readiness programs are funded by state grants issued to priority school districts, which are those in the 50 lowest income communities in the state. Head Start and early Head Start programs are federally funded and follow a federal curriculum. In addition to providing developmentally appropriate educational opportunities for children, these programs teach parents about child development and education and help parents develop self-sufficiency through employment, higher education, housing, and financial literacy support. From 2021 to 2022, there was an increase from 7,124 preschoolers served to 10,133 in school readiness priority district program pardon, district programs. During that same time frame, federal and state Head Start programs increased the number of preschoolers served from 4,026 to 8,252. Once again, on today's WIHS Journal, you heard Emily Byrne from the Connecticut Voices for Children with their agenda for the legislative session here in Connecticut in 2024. For further information, call us at 860-346-1049. 860-346-1049 or drop a line to office at wihsradio.org office at wihsradio.org The opinions expressed are those of the participants not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kutzmer on the WIHS Journal Public Affairs from 104.9 WIHS <laughs>